I've never heard a lesson on fear and trembling, so I thought, I wonder if there could be a sermon inside something like that. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, if you want to start out this morning, we'd like to take a look at that particular passage. This lesson almost could be a part two of last Sunday morning's lesson, which was centered around the second coming of Christ, and we look there about the second coming of Christ as being a day of revelation, and also a day of separation, a day of indignation, a day of condemnation, and also a day of admiration. And so based upon the fact that there's going to be a second coming of Christ, based upon the fact that I know that one day I will leave this earth, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's appointed that a man wants to die after this, the judgment, then of course it would uh, make a lot of sense that I want to, uh, to be very serious about my relationship with the Lord. And I, I know that you are, that you are serious about that. And part of that would involve what we notice in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Maybe that first part we need to notice there, or the first part of the last part of the verse, work out your own salvation. What does that mean? Well, uh, no, it doesn't mean you need to come up with your own plan of salvation. <laughs> you know, you decide what you like in certain types of religious formats, and or you pull out different pieces of the Bible, and you decide that this is going to be my salvation. Or you might do like uh, John Walton of old in the Waltons, where he didn't go to church at all. He just kind of wandered around in the mountains, and that was his worship services. So we're not talking about that. Uh, their salvation has already worked out, and we praise the good Lord for that and Jesus for what he has done and accomplishing all of that. And so my job is to be obedient to that very will of God. So we're not talking about conjuring up our own plan of salvation, but Paul was saying that you've done a great job in living the Christian life when I was watching you, when I wasn't watching you. So you don't need me watching you. You can work your own salvation uh, as you're living the Christian life because you know what to do. You know how to follow Jesus and what Jesus' will is. He says to do that with fear and trembling. But that part about working out your salvation, I think even that has in its context a couple of things that strike us as we're looking at Philippians 2. One would be, if I'm going to work out my salvation, I need to have the attitude of Jesus inside of me. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, Have this mind in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So I need to have a Christ-like attitude. That's part of working out my salvation. And also I need to be a servant like Jesus was. He uh, was in the form of God, took upon himself the form of a bond servant made in likeness as a man. So I want to be a servant like Jesus was. And everything about his life just proclaims the concept of servanthood. But now that part about fear and trembling. It made me wonder as I looked at this verse, are there other verses in the Bible that couple those two things together? You know, the Bible deals a lot with couplets, doesn't it? Uh, believe and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Sing and make melody in your heart. And so that, you know, Christ and the church, you know, you see a lot of things coupled together in the Word of God. And so you have this particular thing that's put together, fear and trembling. So uh, are there other places where fear and trembling are mentioned in the New Testament? One of those places, and there are others, one of those places occurs in the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 5 and verse 33. You remember there the woman with the issue of blood, and Jesus was heading toward the home of Jairus, and as he was doing that, and he's got a big crowd of people around him, and so this lady walks up behind him, and she touches the hem of his garment, and she sort of says to herself, but the Holy Spirit records to us, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be well. And so she uh, says that, and uh, she's healed. Uh, this uh, hemorrhaging that she had dealt with in her life was just dried up, and she was made healthy and whole. And so Jesus turns around and says, Who touched me? His disciples said, Well, what do you mean who touched you? You've got all kinds of people around you. And he knew that virtue had departed from him. And so uh, the woman then, as she knew she had been found out, was filled with a spirit of fear and trembling. It says she, was, she had a fear and with trembling in Mark chapter 5. Uh, being around Jesus could do that to you, couldn't it? Uh, when Peter sees Jesus the first time, he says, Depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. So that would be normal. I think there might have been a little trembling in John the Baptist when he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Even when Jesus was arrested in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, in John chapter, and, and John, we look at the end of, uh, I think chapter 19, 18, uh, the individuals come to surround him, and they're going to take him in for the all-night interrogation at the home of, of Caiaphas and Annas. And before that occurs, though, the people fall backward as they, 
have the announcement made to them that Jesus was he. You know, who are you looking for? Looking for Jesus? I'm he. And so they just kind of fell backward. And so we can understand how that would create that kind of response of fear and trembling. Not only that, though, when Paul was preaching God's word in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, he told the church at Corinth that I preached to you with fear and trembling. I was there fearfully and in much trembling. And the one reason why was Paul didn't make an incredible presence whenever he was preaching. His speaking pattern probably wasn't the best. And so he knew what his message was, and he was determined to get that message out. In fact, that's a good message to all people who want to preach God's Word. You just preach God's Word. It doesn't matter if you're the most eloquent. It doesn't matter if you look the best. You just do the best you can do. Paul did, and look how successful he was. But he said he did that with fear and trembling. On one occasion, he sent Titus to the church at Corinth, and that's recorded in 2 Corinthians 7, 15, that they received him with fear and trembling. So whenever God's messengers come to you, it could cause you to also have a fear and trembling going on within you as a congregation, not because you're scared of the messenger, but you're very much all stricken by the message that is given. And so you have those examples where you have those two words coupled. Then you also have just the concept of fear that's given in the Word of God in a very positive sense. You know, we may think of fear in always a negative connotation, but in a positive sense, the Word of God records it. One of those is found in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. And in Acts 9, 31, Paul had uh, attempted to join himself to the disciples of Christ. And you remember that was met with some reluctance, and then Barnabas speaks up for him, and then Paul then is part of the disciples. He preaches God's Word. And the Word of God says that there was a peace, and also the people were walking in the fear of the Lord, and they were multiplied. Somehow I think all those go together. When there is a peacefulness with one's relationship with God, there is a walking in the fear of the Lord, and people have that kind of respect like they ought to have, multiplication takes place, and we see more and more disciples added to the Lord. And 1 Peter chapter 1, 17, if we're talking about fear, we're told there that we need to pass the time of our sojourning here in fear. And then there are three different reasons given in that same passage or the ones that follow that tell us about why we should do that. Number one, God is no respecter of persons. So he doesn't care if, uh, if I come from a religious family or if I grew up in the Church of Christ or anything along that line. He's going to judge me based upon who I am and what I've done as far as living the Christian life. No respect to persons. That causes me to have a, a respect or a fear of God. Also, the realization of how much it costs for my redemption. I'm told in 1 Peter 1, 18, that I was redeemed not by corruptible things, but by the precious, cleansing, redeeming, atoning blood of Jesus. And also, this plan of salvation wasn't thrown together. This was something planned before the foundation of the world. So that passage then encourages me to have that type of respect or fear of the Lord. But our passage today, Philippians 2, 12, the fear and trembling passage is something we need to be thinking about. That is something that probably in our religious world today, people might not want so much. They don't want to hear that. Kind of leave that out if you don't mind as you are talking about the God that I want. Uh, what kind of God do I want, by the way? What, what do I want my God to be like, as if I had a choice? But what would that be? Well, back in the olden days, years ago, and I, I kind of grew up, I guess, a little too late for some of this, but there was a lot of fire and brimstone preaching. When you, some of you might remember that. I can barely remember it. Uh, you know, when the, the lessons were predominantly on hell and the horror of hell and how terrible it would be to be lost eternally in hell and the sinners in the hands of an angry God type of preaching, the Jonathan Edwards type of thing, where you're suspended over the fiery pits of hell and the only thing that's holding you back is this little tiny thing called your lifeline and your one beat away from eternity. And you could almost just smell the fire and brimstone from sermons like that. And so I grew up on some of that, although, you know, a lot of it happened before I was around or was listening very much to sermons. Some of those you couldn't keep from listening to. And so you would have a lot of responses. Uh, that was back in the days of W.A. Bradfield type of preaching. W.A. Bradfield, some of you might have remembered or heard of, walk up and down the aisles during the invitation song. He'd snap his fingers. He'd say, I believe there's a sinner on this row. I think there's someone here who needs to obey the gospel. 
Is there someone on this row that's lost? Well, can you imagine the pressure when he got to your pew? What are you going to do about that? Yeah, that's scary, isn't it? What if you were the only one sitting on that pew? What are you going to do? <laughs> There's a sinner in this row. So, uh, you know, put a lot of pressure on people. Fire and brimstone. You're going to be lost in hell. And some of these preachers, it's almost like uh, you're going to be lost, and I'm kind of tickled about it. You know, and that's terrible, you know, but that's hard preaching. Uh, scan, the, scan people with your preaching. Uh, make them feel just ready to, to be lost eternally, and then they may not make it, probably won't make it. You'll just be fortunate if you do make it into heaven. On one occasion, my brother was able to do some of that, those kinds of meetings and uh, where you had huge responses, and we were there on a Saturday night at one congregation, and uh, just few people were inside, and people were starting to come in, and, and I said to my mom, I said, it's kind of cold in here, and she said, well, Johnny will get it all warmed up later on. So <laughs> it's talking about just the preaching, you know, that was going to be going on, and that fiery type of preaching. Well, I think people have responded to that by saying, let's do something different. And so a lot of what we've had over the last few years has been that. Let's just stress that God is a God of love, and God's a God of mercy, and He's a God of peace and joy. Anything wrong with that? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. We need that. We desperately need that. But we probably shouldn't forget the other, though, that there should also be some fear and trembling associated with our living of the Christian life. Paul says, I want you to know that, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, uh, what I want to do this morning, just real quickly in our time we have remaining and our time gets by so fast, is just real quickly, first of all, define the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Secondly, we want to take a look at uh, why it's important to us. And thirdly, just how do I keep that in balance in the proper way in my life? First of all, the word fear. The word fear, yurah, used in the Old Testament, describes terror, fear. It's what I felt the first time I went to the Princess Theater when I guess I was uh, six years old, seven years old. Maybe I was older than that. I don't know. But I saw Frankenstein. And when his, his image appeared on that huge screen, I'd never seen a big screen before. And my brother was with me, and I started crying like a baby. And he, I know I embarrassed him, and he had to take me out of the theater. You know, I was filled with terror, I, I, absolute terror, fear. So I can identify with that word. It's, it's something that we can identify with in many ways, you know, where it might be a fear that there could be uh, that C word that we're scared to even think about that could have entered in my life or the life of one of my loved ones, something along that line. It's what we felt after 9-11. I wasn't comfortable after 9-11, were you? I just uh, stayed in front of the TV set a lot as though somehow if I could keep up with the pulse of what was going on in the world, there wouldn't be any more planes flying into buildings somehow. Uh, didn't sleep as well. Uh, there were depressions associated with 9-11. Uh, just an uncomfortableness, waiting for the other shoe to drop. What have they got planned next? Is there something next week that's going on? What will happen? Uh, that type of thing. The, also, the concept of what might inspire fear is included inside that word, something causing fear. Nebuchadnezzar wanted a huge image erected of himself so people would look at that and, and fall down with fear. And so it really angered him when people like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just said, uh, we're not interested in that. We love God. And, well, I'll throw you into a furnace. Yeah, well, if we live, we live. If we die, we die. But we're not going to obey you. And so that incensed him. That made him kind of afraid, in fact. But that type of thing also is part of that word of fear. And then there's a word that we all know real well. And that is the word phobos, which would be from phobia. There are some things people are afraid of, and there's no explanation for it. There are some people who can climb to the highest tower and just think nothing of it. And you'll see them up there. How did they get up there on that huge water tower at the top of that thing? And doing whatever they need to be doing. Uh, be on top of buildings that are huge, high buildings and doing work or maybe washing windows. And there are others who would say, I don't want to do that. I can't do that. I'm afraid of heights. There are people who are afraid of water. I've baptized some over the years who were just were petrified when it came to getting into water and being immersed in water. You mean I've got to go down into the water and be covered up? So we sometimes have people just kind of squat down and go forward into the water. Anything that makes them more comfortable. Uh, fears of all different kinds of things, uh, maybe of insects or whatever it might be. But those, that word is also included, the word phobia. 
or phobos. And then you have a word that we kind of settle on that, that deals with God, and that is the reverence or awe type of fear. And that's probably something a lot of us can identify with concerning our earthly fathers. Now, with my dad, I loved him, and I, and I felt like he loved me, and he loved my brother and my mom, but also I was afraid of him. I didn't live in fear of him. Uh, it wasn't like I didn't know what daddy was going to do next, and he was one of those dads that came home and just for the fun of it would start beating up on his kids. He didn't do anything like that. He was an elder in the Lord's church. But I can knew when I did wrong, and I'd crossed him, that I was going to get some kind of discipline applied to me, and, and I deserved it. I needed that to be done, but I didn't see it then. I needed it, but I see it now. But that was a, that was a, that was a, there was a reverence almost, and, and awe, you might say. So that's the kind of thing we, we kind of land on when we think in terms of the fear of the Lord. Now, we're, we're good with that, aren't we, the fear of the Lord? But what about that trembling part, though? That's something I've never heard anybody talk about much in sermons over the years, and I haven't either. But uh, the word trembling is a word tromas. Tromas almost sounds like trauma, doesn't it? But have you ever seen situations where people were trembling? Uh, maybe where a little child is trembling uh, because something has frightened them so much. Maybe you've, you've trembled sometime at something that scared you so very much. It just caused you to tremble. Uh, do you remember that beautiful song that we sing about, uh, were you there when they crucified my Lord? And sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. And so, so whoever wrote that song could identify with the idea of being so awe-stricken by the cross of Jesus that it caused them to tremble. So that word tremble is something that is in the Word of God. And it certainly is something that you can see in different places in the Bible where that type of thing was going on or it was implied. In 1 Kings 13, Jeroboam had already been responsible as being the revolt king and caused all kinds of trouble, uh, took over the northern kingdom, and it never was any good after that. But uh, he wanted to instill his own form of worship in that kingdom, and he did. And he took the priests that were supposed to be, uh, he took priests from different tribes rather than the tribe of Levi, which was sanctified as being the priestly tribe, had his own feast day. Uh, he created idols, uh, calves and told people to go out and worship them. In 1 Kings 13, he was having a heyday, everything was going his way, having a big feast and all that, and the young prophet rebuked him, remember, and even talked to the altar and said that that altar would have the bones of priests offered upon it, you know, because of that going against God's will. And he was filled with fury, rage, and he wanted that young man to be arrested and no doubt killed. And you remember that there came upon him that horrifying thing when he's had his hand probably stretched out and he couldn't bring it back to him again. It's not working anymore. It's like frozen there. And he is filled with fear. And so his anger immediately turns into, would you pray to God for me? You know, he's like, I need mercy because I wasn't expecting this to happen to my arm. Uh, this, is, this is a frightening thing. Like someone who with their eyesight affected suddenly uh, what a frightening thing. Someone who's not able to suddenly, they, they don't have a feeling in their right, their right leg or a part of their body that suddenly goes numb. It's a frightening thing. So that could cause you to tremble, and probably he did. And speaking of trembling, in Acts chapter 8, you remember Simon the sorcerer? He was a little bit arrogant and proud. So Simon the sorcerer is walking along, and he's watching all the goings-on with Peter and John and the miracles, and he's been baptized. And so he says, I, I just wonder, maybe if I could have something like that. Uh, could I offer you uh, some money? Uh, you know, I'd like to have that gift like you fellows have gotten. Boy, well, Peter looks at him, and I believe it was a look of anger. He said, your money perish with you because you thought that could be purchased. You don't have part nor lot in this type of ministry. You need to pray God and perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. And I mean, Simon the sorcerer, I think probably his face turned white as a ghost and he says, I wish you'd pray for me. Would you pray for me? I think he was too scared to even try to utter a prayer right then. In Acts 24, 24, and 25, Paul talks with Felix, and he talks with him about righteousness. He talks with him about temperance. That's okay. It sounds like a regular preacher sermon on Sunday morning. And then judgment to come. Judgment to come, kind of like what we were talking about last week. And Felix, it says in the King James, I believe, he trembled. In New King James, he was afraid. He was afraid. I like the word trembled. He trembled. 
It scared him. And so that fear and trembling applies so well with all of those. And there are many things in the Word of God that could cause me to tremble if I take them serious. I can get up here and talk about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. And I don't know that anybody's ever going to tremble. I don't think it's going to happen. And I don't think it's because people's hearts are hardened or members of the church have heard those sermons throughout the year so many times it don't mean anything anymore. I just don't think I've got what Paul had. But I know what he had. And what he had was this belief in all of his heart and this power that he had inside of him. And he'd watched the Holy Spirit working inside of him miraculously. And he knows all these things are true. And he's preaching this with a conviction that, that, that maybe we just don't see as much of in this day and time. But we need more and more of. And as he did, Felix trembled. I guess if you preached like Paul would preach toward Felix, you would see that type of response. And so it happened on that particular day. Now, that's what we're looking at with fear and trembling. Do I need it? I do need it. The Word of God tells me in different places. In Proverbs 1, 7, it's the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord causes me to hate evil. Proverbs 8 and verse 13 even causes me to have uh, a longer life. Psalm 20, or Proverbs 10 and verse 27 uh, causes me to depart from evil, causes me to have a satisfying life. Uh, Proverbs 16, 6 and Proverbs 19, verse 23, and gives me riches and honor in life. Proverbs 22, 4. Turn that around, and if I don't have the fear of the Lord, then I'm going to flirt with evil and be corrupted by it. If I don't have a fear of the Lord, rather than being like Joseph, who says when Potiphar's wife approaches him, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I can't do that. Instead, I might say, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll contemplate it. I'll, I'll get back with you later on something like that. We need to hate evil. A fear of the Lord is, is one of those things that can motivate me to do that very thing. I need more than that, mind you, but it's something that could be helpful. I was a pretty good boy. One of the reasons was I wanted to be a good boy. But another reason was I didn't want to be punished by my dad. I needed some of that. Uh, being a young boy, I could have gone a lot of different directions like everybody probably. I had some friends that were better than other friends as far as morality was concerned. But one of the things that kept me in the straight and narrow was the fear, the respect of my parents. So it is with God. I not only want to go to heaven, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be lost eternally. I don't want to imagine what that would be like being in a horrifying place where I'm separated from God throughout all eternity. So I need that, and it helps me as I'm trying to depart from evil and helps me to work out my own salvation as I do so with fear and trembling. I can't please God without it because Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 tells me to tremble at God's Word. Psalm 103, 17 and 18, the mercy of the Lord is upon those who fear Him. You want God's mercy? You better have God's fear. If I want to have the mercy of God, I need to have the fear of the Lord every day of my life. Isaiah had it in Isaiah 6. Interesting, isn't it? Toward the end of Isaiah, you have that fear of the Lord talked about. In Isaiah 6, that's how the book begins. Uh, the Lord is high and lifted up. Isaiah sees all of that. And he just is overwhelmed, and he says, Woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I don't, you know, just don't know if you can use a person like me. One of the seraphim purges his lips. It's like, I'm cleansing you, I'm making you clean. We're made holy, not because of my own intrinsic holiness. God does that for me. And then Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, send me. God can use people like that. People who have a, a fear of him and trembling and also say, here am I, Lord, send me. And then as we bring our lesson to a close, we do need the balance at all times. The Word of God causes us, as we read it, just like Israel of old did in Deuteronomy 31, 10 through 13, as they would get together every seven years and hear the reading of God's Word, and they would do that so they would get the fear of the Lord. In Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. In Romans 2, 4 through 11, and 2 Peter 3, 7 through 14, Read both those passages when you have time because that's a powerful passage in Romans 2 where it shows God's love on all of us, His mercy, His patience. And then if we are not obedient to Him, there's going to be tribulation and anguish that creates a fear of the Lord. In 2 Peter 3, 16 or 7 through 14, you have the powerful passage there where we read about the second coming of the Lord. And people thought back in Noah's day, there's not going to be 
any kind of a flood, and so they didn't worry about it. They didn't listen to Noah. Noah preached his sermons. People would ignore them. People ignore God today. People look at God like he's some great grandpa who can't hurt you. He's just a little doting God that's there standing around, and you can do whatever you want to. If you do something mean, he'll just say, well, I'll say, those little rapscallions, they did something mean again. I'm not going to do a thing about it. He is not that kind of God. He is a powerful God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we need that in our lives, brethren. Every day we need that. Uh, not that alone, but that certainly should be a part of our life, a healthy dosage of that, so we can enter into rest like the Hebrew writer challenges us to do in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. We're told in 2 Corinthians in chapter 7 and verse 1, that we want to be able to get rid of the filthiness of the flesh and the spirit and perfect our holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting our holiness, what a challenge that is for those who are Christians. That means I'm going to keep on getting better at holiness every day. I work hard at that. I strive to be more like God in that way. For those who are not Christians, it's like I want this in my life. I want to have holiness in my life. This morning, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, and can you imagine a better time than right now to become a New Testament Christian? Like the Word of God tells us, today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. This morning, if you're an accountable person, you'd like to obey the gospel of Jesus, our Savior invites you to come to Him. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Or if you have done that and you look at your life and you say, I, I need to have more fear of the Lord in my life. I need to do some more trembling myself. That's a response you could make privately, or if it's one you want to make publicly, certainly that would be the thing to do as well. If you need to respond to our Lord's invitation in any way, we invite you to come to our Savior now as we stand and as we sing together.